So we have the, the first slide, the title, and the second slide. So that's great. It's working. Um, so as, as was said, I have worked in university technology transfer for a very long time, for about 30 years. Um, I worked at University College London, Bristol University, and then Oxford. And five years ago, I stopped working at Oxford, um, and I've been independent uh, since then. Um, I am involved in some investment funds, um, including one in South Africa. I don't know if any people here are from the uh, South Africa Institute, but I have um, been involved in a small fund set up uh, by University of Cape Town, Stellenbosch University and other universities in South Africa to, to make investments into early stage um, technology uh, companies from universities. Um, and um, in the last few years also, I wrote a book which um, describes uh, everything I know about this subject. Um, so if you want to learn more, there it is. So what I want to talk to you about is um, uh, what is technology transfer? Look at these things as projects, project management, then talk a bit about technology transfer offices, um, and then some of the broader ideas of, of who wants what, who's involved, what do they want, um, the balance between or tensions between trying to generate impact and trying to generate income, um, which talks to the purpose and objectives of all of these activities, um, and then talk about the innovation community. But, but first, I wanted to dive straight in and, and talk about um, this amazing example um, that we have of technology transfer. Um, because before the uh, pandemic started last year, so from 2019, before that, people would say, what is technology transfer? What do you do? How, you know, please explain it to me. And you would need to come up with an explanation. Um, I think our job of explaining this uh, has been made um, all the more easy by being able to talk about this Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as an example of technology transfer. So if somebody says to you, what is university technology transfer or research institute technology transfer all about, you can say, well, let me tell you the story of the development of the um, Oxford AstraZeneca uh, COVID-19 vaccine, because this is an amazing example of technology transfer. Um, and I think uh, the words you have here, it, it goes to the fact that sometimes, and it's really important to emphasize sometimes, but sometimes the commercial route is the best way to deliver benefits from university or institute research results. Not always, uh, but sometimes. Um, and I will go on to, to talk more about that. So, so this is a great example, and I will tell a bit of the story. Um, but in terms of in words, you know, you can also look at some words. Um, for what is technology transfer. It's a commercial activity with benefits that go well beyond the opportunity to make money. It involves the identification, protection, and marketing of university research results in order to transfer these into business opportunities. You can talk about the purpose of technology transfer, the purpose of university technology transfer to transfer research results out to business where the results are developed to benefit society. So, you, slightly different emphasis. Some people see it as a very commercial activity. Some people see it broader about uh, impact. Now, this um, uh, story of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So in, in the boxes um, on the right, you've got seven groups of people, um, institutions that were involved in this. So this is an illustration of some of the complexities. And we think sometimes it's a university 
or research institute transferring something to a company, just a simple step A to B, and that's that, and, and off we go. Um, usually it's a lot more complex than that, and, and this example certainly illustrates that. So, you know, you, you have Oxford University as the research institute, you've got the academics, the researchers, the people themselves, the, the, the workers, you've got the tech transfer office, in this case, Oxford University Innovation, You've got a very significant investor, Oxford Sciences Innovation, a spin-out company that was set up by the academics interested in vaccine development a few years ago. You have the large multinational company, AstraZeneca in this case, and then you have the government, the role of the government and a lot of support that came from that. So lots of different people involved um, and over lots of different sort of timescales. So technology transfer isn't something that happens sort of easily, quickly and instantly. Um, it takes a long time to develop cultures of technology transfer, to develop systems and mechanisms for it, and you know, to learn the practice of how to do it and the willingness to do it. So this, this time scale here, it's slightly exaggerated. Um, we have Oxford University being founded a very long time ago. Um, and then we jump forwards uh, hundreds of years. Um, but the start of technology transfer in Oxford in a formal sense in uh, 1987, then the tech transfer office was involved from the early 2000s in beginning to file some patent applications on vaccine technology, uh, not the ones related to the COVID vaccine, but earlier uh, uh, inventions were protected. In 2008, there was a very sort of significant episode. We, we as the tech transfer office, we set up a company called Oxford Emergent TB, Tuberculosis Consortium. And this was, an example of taking a potential uh, TB vaccine candidate, um, working with for-profit organizations in the form of emergent biosciences in the USA and not-for-profit organizations, because TB, as you know, is a, a, a disease that affects rich people and poor people. So we needed to address uh, routes to market for both, but bring in private sector to bring in lots of investment to develop this. So they had access to the, um, the rich people market, but we needed to ensure there was access to medicines uh, for the poor and lower middle income countries as well. So we produced, we formed this joint venture with private money, public money, and got very far towards development of this vaccine. Um, there were clinical trials in South Africa, um, and very sadly, it didn't work. Um, the efficacy was not high enough, but I, I mention it here because it's an example on the path and the learning that we went on uh, as far as this whole vaccine commercialization is concerned. Then back to the, the line, so in 2015, um, this investor, Oxford Sciences Innovation, came along. They have raised £600 million to invest in spin-up companies from Oxford. Um, in 2016, this company, Vaxitech, was formed. Um, and then, of course, 2020, last year, um, the academics involved uh, quickly used their platform technologies to develop the anti-COVID vaccine um, and a deal with AstraZeneca was done quickly. Um, huge amounts of government support to um, scale up the development, testing, manufacturing, um, rapid changes to regulatory approval frameworks to get these things done quickly. Um, and, you know, amazing story of, of how the uh, vaccine is, is being um, delivered. So I wanted to sort of highlight the, the numbers of people involved and the amount of time it can take to, to develop uh, quite a lot of this activity. Now, the next idea to talk about here is, is the words that people use, sort of what's in, included and, and what isn't. Um, so at the broadest level, we're talking about 
ideas coming from the whole research base. And the research base in a country is structured in, in different ways. So we have um, universities, government labs, PROs, um, you know, public research organizations, foundations, hospitals, international centers uh, like yourselves. And um, however the research is organized in a country, we're looking at um, the results that come out of the research base. And then over here, we, we come across these different words, commercialization, technology transfer, and these are the sort of the core of uh, what I've been involved in, in working on and the transfer to business to develop products to benefit society. So taking the commercial route. Um, people talk more generally about knowledge transfer, which is an important point. It's not just technology. It might be knowledge from non-technology areas. Uh, they then talk about exchange because it's not just a, a one-way transfer from the research base to business. These things are often developed in collaboration, so that's important. Wider engagement. And then the third mission of universities, um, teaching, research, and the third mission of wider engagement, knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer, tech transfer, commercialization. So I think these things sort of grow out in, in, in scale. But those are some of the words that you come across. Now, the, the fundamental problem uh, or the fundamental situation, um, which is usually viewed as a problem, um, is the expectations. So from a university research point of view, um, there's a certain set of expectations. And from industry, investors, business, there's different expectations. So on the, on the research side, these two photographs are photographs of uh, university research or any research lab bench. And for the research side, um, this is the end of the thing. It works. My job is complete. Fantastic. Um, I've been working on this for years. I've got it to work. It worked once. That's it. Brilliant. Move on. Next thing. So um, that's completely different from the industry investor business perspective. They come into the lab and they look at this and they say, OK, so where do we start? Um, so the research people think they finished. Um, and the business people think they haven't even started. Um, and, and there's a gap. And the gap is uh, often referred to as the sort of the valley of, of death in terms of how do you get the amazing potential of the research results? How do you sort of shape them so that uh, industry investors recognize them as an important and, and, and useful uh, activity? So we look now at a basic sort of project progression uh, through technology transfer um, of identifying opportunities, evaluating them, protecting them, marketing them, doing a deal, um, and then managing uh, the relationship. And that deal may be to an existing company or it may be uh, to a spin-out company. Um, and what I want to do now is just talk for a few minutes about some of these different uh, stages, uh, starting with protect, protection, intellectual property rights. Um, now, I'm not about to give you a, a lecture on intellectual property rights. Um, you can read about this yourselves. You can learn a lot about it. Some of you will have experience. Um, you can go on a one day course or a, a one week course on this. Uh, so there's a lot to learn. But in short, uh, intellectual property rights, patenting, trade secrets, copyright. So it's not just patents. It's quite broad. There are other things to think about. But patenting is often in our scientific uh, biomedicine areas is often where we focus um, because we're talking about um, inventions arising from research activity. So you are making inventions. Now, you may also be developing copyright material. You may be developing uh, software which has copyright protection, um, but often you're making fundamental inventions. And the, the thing with patenting, it's very complicated, but it boils down to three areas. Uh, is your invention new? Uh, is it clever? And is it useful? Now, the, these are everyday words, which I like because they 
are different from the jargon that's used in patenting. They talk about novelty. They talk about prior art, uh, inventive steps, problem solution approach, etc. But one of the key things, I think one of the single most important things to know about this um, is that if you publish your work, your invention, your ideas, before you file a patent application, you lose, you destroy the opportunity for getting patent protection. So the invention needs to be new or novel compared to everything else that's been published, including your publications. So if you publish something and then you go along to the tech transfer office or the patent office and say, um, I'd like to file a patent application, I've made an invention. They say, um, has it been published? Yes, I'm sorry, you can't get a patent. So in red here, we have this phrase, think patent before you publish. Now, this is a, a, a state of mind, it's a culture. Um, it may take you half a second to think patent before you publish. Um, it may not be something you care about. Um, this is not for everyone, um, and it's not for every technology, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. So I encourage people to, to think patent before you publish. And if you think there is an opportunity which you're interested in pursuing, talk to your technology transfer office, your, your patent office, uh, et cetera. But there's another important point about patenting, which is, um, can we patent this? Is it patentable? But then number two, does it make sense to patent it? And this is important because patenting costs money, it costs quite a lot of money. Um, it costs you know, thousands of pounds, thousands of euros to get going. And over the time of applying for and getting your patent in lots of different countries, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of pounds or euros uh, or your currencies. Um, and so the question is, can we patent it, but do we want to? Is there a need for the technology? Do we think it might make money? Is now the right time? Um, what about freedom to operate? This is a bit of, of, of jargon that even if you're allowed to use your invention, um, can you actually uh, use it in the real world based upon the fact other people have patents for inventions which sort of govern or control uh, yours. Um, so, you know, you can view, are there sort of umbrella patents out there? You might have made a small improvement, but you can't use your improvement without permission from other people. Are you free to operate your patent? So lots of different uh, issues that come in. One point I always like to talk about as well is uh, patent searching. Um, there are amazing publicly available um, free patent search uh, services out there. So Espasnet is from the European Patent Office, uh, USPTO, the US Patent Office. Lens is an independent organization. These are patent searching databases. And I find it fascinating uh, talking to researchers who haven't looked at these, but then start to look at them and realize what is already out there. Because when you file a patent application, it's published after 18 months. And so then you can read all the patent applications that other people have published. And you may see things that actually touch upon your research, or maybe even they did your research uh, before. So moving from the patenting route to market, um, what are we thinking about? There are lots of different alternatives. You can publish it, obviously. You don't need to take the commercial route. You can keep it secret. Or from a commercial tech transfer point of view, license it to an existing company, license it to a new company. And there's often this debate about um, licensing to an existing company or setting up a new uh, spin-out company. And people say, how do you decide? And I often say, what makes you think you have a choice? Uh, both of these are very, very difficult. Um, and you know, it's the art of the possible as much as being faced with, with choices. Um, and it can get quite complicated. So I think the thing to do 
is to talk to the market, talk to companies, talk to investors, talk with researchers, um, to think what, given the technology we've got, given the opportunity we've got, what might the possibilities be? What might the, the particular opportunities uh, be? And, and here we say, if an existing company is willing and able to sign a decent license deal, why would you set up a new company? There is a big trend for setting up new spin-out companies at the moment, um, partly because of the availability of investment money, partly because bigger companies are taking less risk and are less likely to take on your early stage technology, and partly because it's a trend. Um, so there is a lot more interest these days uh, in setting up new technology companies. But thinking about licensing to an existing company for a moment, the really big questions, do they have the commitment to invest in your idea? What you're trying to do is get other people to spend their money uh, on your idea. And that's, you know, this isn't easy. This isn't easy by any means. Um, and so you want to make sure before you let them have access to this that they're going to make a good job of uh, developing uh, your particular uh, technologies. So you then want realistic financial terms, realistic deals. Negotiation, I mean, a licensing transaction is a negotiation between so you, your tech transfer office, your institution, um, and a company. And probably the company is better at negotiating than you are. It's just the way these things are. They do it frequently all the time uh, and you don't. Um, so it can be very difficult to sort of scale up and get the expertise to do a negotiation successfully. Not so you make lots of money, but just so it's a, it's a positive process rather than a, a, a frustrating one. Um, and in the company you're talking to, it's very important to have an internal champion in a senior position so that um, your project, when it goes into that company, is well supported uh, and uh, well developed. Now, moving on to talk a bit about spin out companies. Um, so we, there's different words are used again. So I talk about spin out companies. Sometimes these are called spin off companies. Um, and spin out and spin offs, I think, are, are the same. I think spin out is a better description of, of, of the process. Um, and we also hear about startup companies. So from a tech transfer point of view, um, startup companies are often student uh, started companies uh, rather than academic research uh, spin out companies. And it, it's different because students are uh, you know, younger, more independent, uh, more likely to move on. The uh, intellectual property developed by the students is probably independent and may not be owned by the university or the institute. I'm talking about undergrad, really. Um, so you need a different approach. But for spin-out companies, uh, the intellectual property will be owned by the university or research institute. There will be a technology transfer office helping uh, to develop uh, the process and, and build the team. Now, now this picture, this is probably 20 years old, this diagram. It comes from uh, Oxford University, the tech transfer office there, uh, which um, when I worked there was called ISIS Innovation. And it it talks about this whole business of who's involved in a spin-out company and the roles people play. So we start in the university and we're thinking there's a head of a research group, the professor, let's say, um, maybe some science, senior scientist. And the sort of culture and expertise in the university is it's, oh, excuse me, it's all about the science with a bit of support. Um, now, this person has grown up and made a successful career in research university life, so probably will not move into the new company. The new company is a very different organization. Science counts for some of it, 
but there's also issues of production, sales, marketing, finance, and admin. So the whole thing is sort of turned on its head in terms of the role of the science in the business. But this person, the, the postdoc, may well move across uh, into the company and become the research director. But the question is, who is going to run the company? Running a company is very different skill set uh, from being a good researcher. So to run the company, you need to understand all of this. So probably these people don't have those skills. So you bring in, you find a new um, person to join the team who's got existing business experience, and they are the entrepreneur. Now, sometimes one of the postdocs may be the entrepreneur, and that's great. But bear in mind that if you've grown up as a scientist, um, it can be very difficult to convince investors that you also have those entrepreneurial uh, skills. So then we begin to think if we're going down the spin out company route or, or not, in fact, where do we get support from? Um, and so we look at that, this channel of, of project management stages, and there's a few, again, bits, words or bits of jargon that come into it. So we hear about incubators and accelerators, and these can be activities, programs in your university, in the local city, open to you, um, which can help support you and your project um, at almost every stage of this particular process. So, for example, you have a student incubator um, activity where you can go to a, a, a building, meet some people who will help you because they understand about identifying, evaluating, protecting, etc. And they hold your hand through the process. Um, and they may have a building. Uh, there may be a room where you can sit down and spend time developing. They may have some basic labs um, where you can sit down and, and help try to develop your products. Um, in the biosciences, it's unlikely they will have wet labs that you can access on a casual basis. It's just too expensive. Um, they may then also run an accelerator program. And an accelerator program is generally the idea that it's a, a support program over a fixed period of time, uh, one month, six months, um, and they actively help accelerate your project through various steps and various programs uh, so that it gets through to market uh, faster. We, we also talk about proof of concept support uh, and seed fund support. And proof of concept support and proof of concept funds are a very important part of this whole story. So you have your research funding um, and then you get to the end and, and you've done the work that you can get research funding for, but it still is not recognizable by industry or investors as a business proposition. So you need some more money to prove the concept, maybe to uh, build a prototype to generate more data to support the patent application, um, to produce a little video describing uh, what you've got to help it as communicated. So you want some money um, to do some proof of concept work before you can do a deal. And then you may get to the stage where you're doing a deal, uh, you're setting up a spin out, but you need investment, you need uh, seed fund investment. Uh, so we hear about uh, proof of concept funds and seed funds, and they play slightly different roles uh, at slightly different times. Now, from a, a UK point of view, um, the University Challenge Seed Fund that was launched in 1999 um, was a fantastic program for stimulating uh, the creation of seed funds um, and proof of concept funds and really started this whole activity going in the UK uh, 20 years ago. And this was government money, um, plus money from the Wellcome Trust as a foundation, plus a smaller foundation called Gatsby Foundation. They put together some money which universities could bid for on a three to one basis. So 
they provided three pounds or euros um, uh, or rand or whatever, or rupees, whatever, uh, for every one that the university put in. Um, and so the university had to show some commitment um, and you needed to have an external fund manager partner. Um, so typically, uh, Oxford had a four million pound fund and it could use this to invest uh, in projects. But this comes on to the idea of, of peers and bridges. Um, this is a the picture here on the left is a peer. So this is somewhere in the north of England and you go along, you um, stand on the beach, you go in the building, you walk out along the pier and you're having a nice time, um, but you haven't reached business. You haven't got to the other side. Um, and you can view this as being sort of proof of concept funding. If it's only coming from one side, uh, you've got a challenge. What you want to do uh, is you want to build your bridge from both sides. Um, and so as well as pushing things out from the university research side, you also want um, industry investors collaborating with you and pulling things uh, across. So, so I'll move now just to talk briefly about the role of the technology transfer office. Um, there are lots of people now working in technology transfer offices around the world, um, and there are networks that support them. So um, in Italy, there is the NetVal network, which is um, meeting uh, friends and colleagues at these meetings is, I think, the reason why I'm talking to you today. It's a, it's a great network of tech transfer professionals. In Europe, there's ASTP. In South Africa, there's a very strong network of tech transfer people called Sarima. In the USA, Autumn. In the UK, Praxis Oral. So it's a well-established uh, profession, a well-established uh, activity uh, these days. There are different models for tech transfer offices, sometimes uh, administration unit within uh, the institute or the university, in fact, very commonly, or sometimes a separate company, sometimes working together with colleagues in the research office or the research collaboration office, sometimes in one place, sometimes spread across uh, a campus. Uh, so lots of different things. The, the people involved in technology transfer offices um, obviously very important. People are important with everything. Um, and this is a model which gets across the idea of the tech transfer people. You want people to understand uh, the academic world here, uh, who understand the commercial world and the financial world, so they can act as these sort of three-dimensional intermediaries, helping connect uh, academics with investors with business people and these are difficult people uh, to find um, but I think it shows the skill set required uh, in the tech transfer office. There's also a lot of policy aspect to this so um, you know the, it's an area which requires quite a lot of regulation and rules who owns the intellectual property and you know, probably the answer is your institute, but you as a scientist, you feel you have emotional ownership of this. Um, and so, um, you know, bear in mind that you may not be the legal owner, but it's really important that whoever is the legal owner works collectively with you and involves you in the process. And then there'll be rules on revenue sharing, spin out shareholdings. Um, and this is a hugely, complex area. I, I make the point here because it's important to know uh, what the rules are. So uh, moving on a bit, um, I think some of these broader concepts that I that I mentioned, um, sort of who wants what, who's involved in all of this? And the answer is it's quite complicated. So um, there's a lot of different people involved, a lot of different perspectives. Um, and they probably want slightly different things from this technology transfer process. Um, so what do they want? And do these um, desires overlap? Um, and you can look at this, as I said earlier, in terms of income. So for some people, it's about the money. Uh, for other people, it's about impact. 
So for some people, it's about money and jobs and sustainable economic growth. For others, it's about building the reputation of an organization, having great case studies and having great stories and benefiting society. And, you know, usually, like most things in life, it's a balance. It's a bit of a mixture uh, of both of these things. Uh, but certainly, um, it, it's quite a complicated point as to how you balance uh, income uh, and impact when you're doing a technology transfer program. There's another whole aspect of this which is connected, which is how do you measure success? So what are we trying to achieve? How do we measure it? How do we report it? Um, and you can tell great stories, the narratives, like I've we've looked at the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as a great story about university technology transfer. This Apple is another one. This Apple was developed um, plant breeding programs at KU Leuven in Belgium. Um, and is a great story of people eating millions of these apples every year. Uh, or you've got lots of data and there's lots of data that's used to monitor progress uh, in this area. Um, I also think there's a bigger point in assessment and, and measurement um, and reporting, which I'm not sure we've got quite right yet in the tech transfer world. Um, I'm not sure we're thinking about what we really care about. So what do we really care about? I think the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a clue to this. Um, and when you look at those in, in detail, it's difficult to disagree uh, with anything that you see there. Um, and so we care about these things, but what is technology transfer doing about climate change, about gender diversity, about racial diversity? And I think this is a new phase of thinking. And we can think, what, how can we support these activities in our organizations, in our, you know, who is coming through with disclosures to us? Um, are we seeing disclosures from women as well as men? Are we seeing disclosures from people of color? Are we seeing ethnic diversity? The way we organize our offices, are we looking at diversity? The way we're developing projects, are they benefiting different groups uh, of people? And I think this is an interesting area to think about for us as tech transfer people. Um, but also, um, you know, thinking as broadly as possible about what is it we're all actually trying to do. And this is not straightforward. Uh, I've talked for the last 40 minutes or whatever about this. Um, and we keep on thinking, we keep on thinking about getting the right balance. We know what the activities are, but the right balance of mission uh, and purpose and objectives. Uh, finally, I just want to leave with, with another thought. We talk a lot, uh, I like to talk a lot about the innovation community. Now uh, this is different to an ecosystem. Uh, in an ecosystem, um, the different organisms are usually um, trying to kill and eat each other. And I don't think that's a very sort of helpful way to look at this challenge that we have. I like to think about innovation communities of people and who are the people that we need to connect with and work with in our particular location uh, in order to make good things happen. And, and these are the people. So, you know, you're in the middle, whoever you are, you're in the middle. Um, and these are all the other types of uh, people and organizations that you need to connect with. But I think if, if we view this as a community activity rather than an ecosystem activity, I think it might help uh, for the right people to get to know each other uh, and, and to get things done and to learn uh, and develop. So I will finish there. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen um, and back to you.